a great pleasure to see you all. And uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a journey through Cambodia, Angkor, in fact, and the Bhante Chama, because I've worked for many, many years here in Cambodia, and the idea of talking about timber shook me rigid, because when I started thinking, or when I was asked, can you give a, a talk on your experiences of working in, in Angkor, I said, but there's very little timber there. The stonework was very much a copy of uh, the, the details in, in the stonework was uh, very much a copy of, of carpentry. So I've tried my best to illustrate um, these interesting features and also to take you on a tour of the sites that I've worked on in Angkor because they were some of the, you know, the great structures. Um, and at the same time as uh, learning a little bit about the, act of the timber that were timber uses in Angkor, you will learn a little bit about the history. So actually my background, uh, I wanted to give you some background as to where I discovered timber, or wood as uh, you like to call it. And one of the, I think a very good way of introducing it is, this is a very famous set of bas-relief, carved stone on a huge long wall uh, in the Bayon, where you notice that the beautiful trees they have. Um, and these trees are always the same, and I'm still trying to find out, in fact, what the tree is. But it, it uh, appears very, very frequently in all of the bas-relief, even in Angkor Wat and, uh, and up in Bhante Chama, which is where I was working as well. <coughs> anyway, these are the great big trees of Angkor, uh, the Dipterocarpus alatus magnificent timbers and they are very 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 tall i don't know whether you've had, you've actually seen any of them while you've been uh, on your excursions um, and they are really the the key building timber and uh, they also supported the local poor villagers who used to draw the sap to actually provide light uh, oil lamps in their, in their houses. And these would belong to a particular family. They'd have two or three in, in the forest, and they would regularly go around collecting the, the oil, as it were, uh, to, to uh, burn in their houses. The other use was obviously for corking boats. And uh, as you probably also found out, there are a lot of uh, very fine wooden boats here. In our explorer, I could give you a very quick history of Cambodia or architecture in Angkor. The Angkorian buildings, the pre-Angkorian buildings, were uh, built uh, more than likely in timber. And then the very next set in the, um, in the 7th, 8th century, out in Rolos, which is about 12 kilometers from here, they started, there was a good quality clay out there, and they, they started building in brick. Very soon, they also found that uh, stone was available, sandstone, which is in the Kulen Hills, about 50, uh, 50 odd kilometers from Angkor. And they started bringing that in for decoration. And the, uh, so the windows, the doors, uh, we're getting there, the doors um, and the statuary were inserted into the brick. Brick didn't last for very long because they very quickly decided they wanted to cover it with uh, stucco work. And so you have this extraordinary 12th century, no, I'm sorry, 8th, 10th century stucco. We've seen Diptorocarpus solatus. Then this is another fantastic tree. This is the larger Stromia, and it's locally known as Sralo. And this timber is a very, very dense, hard timber. Um, which is used, it's hard to work. I mean, maybe some of the carpets are having a tough time now. Um, it is used mainly for uh, plowshares and things like that. It's a very dense, very popular uh, timber. 
You then move on to this giant of a tree, the Tetramiles nudiflora. And this is an extraordinary tree because it's, I hate to say it, it's basically useless. It is, um, the French had a wonderful term for it, fromager. Uh, and I one day asked one of the leading Frenchmen who was working here with the Ecole Francaise, well, why do you call it fromager? He said, you know what fromage means? And I said, well, yes, of course I do. But he said, well, you can imagine us poor French sitting out uh, having lunch in the steaming hot July and really craving for a nice glass of wine and some cheese. Doesn't this look like a piece of brie? And it does. <laughs> and so that's how, and I remember when I first started doing research, I, would, uh, I looked up Fromager and I could find no reference at all to it. Anyway, the birds enjoy the seeds because these enormous trees, um, at about this time they're, they're um, producing flowers and the seeds, the birds really enjoy, so they gulp them down and they gestate in the bird's stomach. And then, sure enough, sometime a little later, the bird will uh, pop it out in a nice little pile of manure. And the tree, the, the tree roots will then slowly find their way, or rather fast, their way down through the timber, through the building, the structure, until it gets to the ground. And then often these roots are up to 50 meters away from, from the, the actual base of the temple. Uh, and so, You'll see, I'll give you many, many examples. Um, this one is growing straight out of, uh, out of the, um, the top of the roof here. They have no structural integrity whatsoever. The branches will just fall off as and when they want. If there's a strong wind, there's danger. Many of the very important temples have these trees in them growing off the temples and they cause a lot of damage. It was uh, one particular temple, Taprom, um, was one of the favorites of the French, the Ecole Francaise when they were here, and they were very suspicious of any suggestion of taking these trees down. They said, no, no, this is part of the romance of this temple. You mustn't touch them. And so these trees kept growing and growing and growing, and I'm talking about maybe a hundred years now. Um, and um, they have caused undue damage. I remember once one of the, the UNESCO, one of the UNESCO director generals came in. Everyone gets taken to Prom, to Taprom, and he walked in. Everyone thought he would be gushing with enthusiasm, and he looked around and he said, "Hmm." You've got problems here, all these trees are dead. And they thought, what? He was actually a botanist, a very well-trained botanist, and exactly what he was saying was true. So yeah, here is an example of the, uh, of the fromager, and I like this slide because I saw this when it was so high. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And within, you know, a few, 10 years, 15 years, it has gone to being a very strong tree. And there are several examples which um, the Indians are now working in Taprom and they're having to prop up, not the building, but the tree because of the worry it's, it's causing. And I think one of the things that I very soon realized, and one of the great messages I think that this... Uh, uh, you know, this symposium should give over to the, uh, the people who are looking after uh, these monuments is that there should be proper management, forestry management. No one, as far as I remember when I was working here, did very much to actually look at the trees and to estimate what the damage, possible damage was that they were going to cause. Uh, it, you know, and then it's too late. So. The really needs not only to manage these trees because they're the most uh, ones that cause most problem, but to look at all the trees and protect the great uh, dipt uh, dipterocarps as well because 
most of the timbers I remember in my early days here from, uh, from up in the, the forests up further north were being shipped out, sold, across the border. And most of the, the, I'll show you some pictures of the very end, showing the forest of, uh, <coughs> between 1945 and then 2003, next. <coughs> so, um, as I explained, what we're going to try and do is a very quick tour around Angkor and in Bantichma to give you some idea of A, the temples, and B, the trees that grow in them. Next. A map, I'm sure you've now found out where you are. This is the great lake, the Tonle Sap, which you flew over. And um, on the, an Angkor, Siem Reap is on the north uh, eastern end of it, Angkor. And then the other temple that I'm going to be showing you is up close to the border uh, between Thailand and, and Cambodia called Bante Chama. And these uh, Bhante Chama was built at the same time by the famous architect Jayavarman VII. I don't have time to go into the history, so we just keep <coughs> moving on. Angkor Wat. This is obviously a very special site, and um, I thought I ought to show you this aerial view of it. I spent a lot of time flying around with one of the leading American uh, photographers to get this. But what I, one of the reasons I show it is because Angkor Wat has and is surrounded by forests. But after the abandonment of uh, Angkor in the 15th century, uh, everyone got the impression that that was it. But the, one of the very few sites which were maintained was Angkor Wat because there are two Buddhist um, monastic complexes that have basically taken care of the area. Okay, next. <coughs> this is a, an amazing picture. This represents a naga, the, the famous naga, which is the protector of, uh, of the ground. And it's, you find them in all forms all over the place. I just happened to be driving by one day and saw this unbelievable cloud over Angkor Wat. So I thought it was worth showing because this, this sort of magic happens here in Cambodia. Next. The major site that I worked on was Prakan, and when we first arrived, it was pretty covered in jungle, and we had an amazing project uh, trying to sort out and conserving it. The, con the concept of architectural conservation is one of really saving the building, it, repairing it, <coughs> and not in any way falsifying history. Next. <coughs> this, was one of the, this was the main entrance into uh, uh, Prakan when I first arrived. You can see that these two very large uh, from Ajay, which caused an enormous amount of trouble. Next. They're still there, but we were able to clean up most of it. But can you imagine trying to take a tree down like this? No, none, not one of our workers, even the lightest guy, would go up the tree because it is so structurally, uh, you know, it has no structural integrity that there's always fear that the branch will break off even if a bird lands on it. So it's still there. <laughs> Next. This is the famous Hall of Dancers. Um, and I just, uh, again, wanted to show you what it was like when we first went there. And I soon uh, enlivened it by having, we used to hold these wonderful dances, in fact, to, uh, <coughs> to, to raise funds. This is Prayer Khan, 1186. Okay, next. The other major project I worked on was up in Bhante Chamar, and it was of the same period, the 11th, 12th century. Uh, and this one really was still in the jungle. And it contained these magnificent uh, stone faces, but every area, every square meter was, uh, was uh, in danger of trees and the activity of trees. Um, 
It was all <laughs> built of sandstone and it like Angkor Wat and uh, many of the other temples, it had a moat around it. And it was only one of three that actually had the sculpted bas-relief walls. Again, depicting beautiful trees. Next. This is the size, it, uh, it was probably about the same size as Angkor Wat in, in area, with a moat, and you can see plenty of trees. Okay, next. These wonderful faces, uh, which we were actually working on to try and uh, do our very best to conserve and repair them. Next. And unbelievable bas-reliefs. We spent uh, several, several years piecing these together. Most of it had totally collapsed. That's another story. But I, the reason I wanted to show them to you is because of the wonderful boats. And also you see the same type of tree appearing. Next. Okay. This is an interesting comparison. The synergy. To start with, the temple supports the tree. As I explained, the birds lay the seeds on the top and slowly, slowly, they, the, under the, uh, growing through the temple, they, um, uh, they go in search of, of, uh, of water. But then suddenly, slowly, 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 the whole system changes. Next. And here are, these are the roots of that tree that we've just shown you. And the damage that they cause is unbelievable. Okay, next. <coughs> this, believe it or not, is you can just make out the bits of stone, okay? This is in the Bapuan, and this is the famous Tetramiles in action. Right next door is the Shralo, funnily enough. Okay, next. And here is a, 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 a very uh, good example. Beautiful tree, okay? And it's this tree. And it's one of the projects we worked on. And I used to use this as a, a, a test case, taking people to the site and uh, asking them for help. What should we do with this tree? This area here, next, is here. What should we do? Should we save the temple? Or should we save the tree? <laughs> I wonder what many of you would say in this case. Save the tree. Yeah. Yes, most people love this tree because it's so pretty, so beautiful. You can't save them. Uh, um, you can't save either one or the other because why not? They're now dependent on each other. Well, you know that was the answer. I was caught out. I mean, there was an American. Uh, an American um, specialist from uh, Peace, um, sorry, the, um, what's it called? Who look after the, all the big sites, the, uh, the conservationist mm -hmm. aspect of the big sites. Uh, he came along, very well known guy, and I asked him the question, you know, thinking I was being a bit smart. And he said, John, there's a very simple answer. And I said, yes, what is it? He said, you have to manage the tree. And there's so much sense in that. And this goes back to the, this concept that I mentioned earlier on, that these trees, they need to be properly looked after. This is like a big forest, um, but you're not probably cultivating the trees for, for use. You're actually creating a park. It's a park service, that's where it came from. And um, we tried to do that very thing. Um, but unfortunately, and this, it's still there um, and still waiting for the ideal person to come along and say, okay, we need to manage it. This is a tiny little temple in, uh, just on the outskirts of Angkor um, in a forest. And this tree is one of the great examples. And it can be very simply managed by thinning out, cutting out the dead wood because a lot of this is um, another type of tree, I can't actually remember what it was, that has been strangled by the strangler fig. And the strangler fig actually produces all the greenery now. Next. Uh, another, this is a very interesting issue. 
And this was a little shrine um, which had been built in, in Prakan. And you can see these are roots from one of these massive trees above. Um, and we managed to clear them out and to protect the, uh, any further damage here. But no sooner had we done it than it became a shrine and an apsara as opposed to uh, just one of many of these that surround the whole area. Next. Okay, if you haven't seen these strangler figs in action, they are uh, pretty frightening. And you just wonder what you have to do. They should never get to this stage. They should be carefully removed. And I had a program in, uh, in all the projects where we used to go around just before they start you know, regenerating or going green, just trimming them, cutting them back, pulling out them, putting them out. And this, in many ways, saves thousands of dollars worth of, of uh, having to restore or conserve them. Next. And here is a very good example. This, these are the famous bas-relief in, uh, in Bhante Chama. And once we cleared back to actually find and see these, we noticed this growth. These walls are put together. There's no mortar. They're dry joint. So the, you know, there's water passing through when the roots go in. And then they start growing and expanding. And this is the root from here. And that's it once it came out. And it caused a lot of damage because there is very little room for any movement in these stone walls because the joints are usually very, very tight. How they get them as tight as they do, we still haven't really worked it out. And uh, we ended up. Next. Um, oh no, this maybe it's coming later. Um, another problem with uh, growth trees around, these are the very fine uh, Gopura uh, gateways uh, in and out of Angkor Tom. And this one is facing north. And I've noticed recently how much the, uh, the, the moss growth on this is. It looks very pretty. But you know, someone should go up there and just spend a day. That's all it'll take. At the moment, the, you know, when the moss is there, it dries out, it shrinks, and then takes the surface of the stone off. It's a very simple job, and I can assure you that whatever chemicals you use to remove this, it always come back because the porous porosity of the stone is almost zero. And so you get this continual growth. This is maintenance. That's the most important word of any in the, in the vocabulary of conservation, conserving and restoring monuments. Maintenance, regular maintenance. Don't leave it until you have to do something. Do it on a regular basis. Go next. And this is a, an example. This is a fairly simple tree that we had to take down. You build a scaffolding. You go up and you chop, 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 you know, and slowly bring it down. Um, and this was done because there was obviously threatening this uh, part of the, of the temple. And it came down with no trouble at all. And uh, then, you know, it was getting clearing the roots, etc. This is actually a different one. But it was pure maintenance. Okay? Um, you imagine trying to do it on the, the one I showed you earlier on with the lean, the great lean on it. I don't know. I'm glad I'm not there anymore at the moment. Okay, next one. Now I'm going to go show you a whole series of uh, pictures that um, where timber must have been used. Where and these, this is a famous site, Prairie here. It's right on the edge. It was between. <coughs> The, board, the boundary between Thailand and, uh, and Cambodia. A wonderful, wonderful site that just climbs up, up, up on a slope and then falls off. There was the boundary between Nepal, uh, sorry, um, Cambodia and uh, Thailand. A 300-meter th uh, drop. Um, and up there, 
there was very certain evidences of uh, pillar uh, post holes. You can see them here, you can see them down here. And it must have, they must have used it for uh, providing a shelter for, for dignitaries when they were coming. I doubt if they were put in uh, when they were building the temple. Uh, it may be difficult to see, but through this wonderful doorway, you can notice here um, holes for timber purlins. Okay? And these... Um, the, these would have had a pitch roof. Next. Another very important temple, Pimeniakos, uh, which is right in the center of, um, of Angkor Tom. Uh, and this, I remember, there was a lot of archaeology going on here. The French spent about nine years uh, investigating in this area. And I remember once going there, and they found this huge, great post hole. And only a few days ago, next one, I was looking around in uh, the depot of the Department of Archaeology, and here was the re remnants of a piece of, of post, which dated back to the, well, it was um, probably the 9th, 10th century. Um, I asked them what it was, and they were unable to give me an answer. And I know that Peter has a thing about trying to understand what timbers, are, you know, the, the names of the timbers here. I've given you a few, at least. Next. Here, here's another much better example of the, um, uh, which automatically one assumes were in timber, and um, you can see the shape of the roof. This, uh, they moved into, and this was one of the earliest sites in, in Nepal, in uh, Cambodia. And you've got both uh, the, um, uh, over here, Stralau, and this is the Diptera Kaab. Next. Another site, which um, is totally abandoned now. This is Bante Top, which is way up in the north. And we were in there. Um, looking around, I, it was petrifying because the whole this was in a very uh, dangerous state of collapse. But we did notice timber, and this goes on to show this. This was a post anchor what? I'm showing you some pieces from there, um, and these timbers have been hanging around for for centuries and are still very solid. Um, and still in some way holding this building together. Next. Here we are. And this is thanks to Mike because I, I, uh, he, got, he took these pictures. He's gone though. <laughs> um, they are actually came from Angkor Wat, not the Bayon, which he, uh, he told me. But they are obviously the original timbers. And in Angkor Wat, that means they date from the 11th century. There are other pieces which have been added later, but these, are, I think, are, are the real genuine piece. Next. This, again, is also Angkor Wat. And um, this was the roof or the ceiling to the galleries. Um, and the French found samples of the timber uh, these timber ceilings, coffered ceilings, and they thought, okay, well, we should make a sample showing what it looks like. So this actually is made in concrete. Later on, and just around the corner at the end here, this is the famous, well, the, uh, the uh, roof, the ceiling to the uh, churning of the sea of milk, where I did quite a lot of work. Um, and. Here they attempted to put back, after my time, um, a, a piece. So above this you have the, the, um, the underside of the corbel. These are called crude vaults, not because they're rough and ready, but because the simplicity of them. They project, how much time have I got? They Five minutes. <laughs> they project, uh, the, each stone projects just a, a third until they meet in the middle. Next. 
These doors, you'll find in all the, uh, certainly the early temples, these doors um, are on three sides of a shrine. The main entrance is usually to the east, and these are false doors. But they give you a very clear idea of what the door, the wooden doors, would have been like. And you can see where the, the, the entrance um, on the east, where the, um, uh, what are they called, the pintles of, of the wooden doors would have been, double doors, and these would have been the, the door jam, as it were. Beautiful pieces, and, uh, but there's no evidence so far of actually one in timber. Next. The other thing, and I'm really happy that uh, people are, that several people doing uh, joinery turning, uh, because these are the way the uh, these balusters are made uh, to, as it were, block out the a lot of the weather in many of the early temples, and the the very crude ones. I'll show you a very crude one earlier on, which is much earlier than these. But these are incredibly fine, and really, as you can see, they're quite high. You know, they're, they're close on uh, at least one and a half meters in height, and they are turned on a lathe. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing whether, in fact, the you know the people who've worked on are working on uh, in wood, whether they've ever turned a, a stone uh, column. Um, next. Another very interesting feature is that these, this is a, uh, the Bapuan, and this is one of the earlier, earlier stone structures uh, where you can see they use a, a mitre joint, which was obviously copied from a carpentry joint. And when you get to the other side, you can see that it's exactly the same way as you would have built, you would have uh, made the joint if it had been in timber. Next. And these are, you've got both here, you see. These are the rather crude ones dating from the 9th, 10th century. Um, and one of the first buildings to actually be built fully in stone. Uh, next. One of my favorites, and I was walking around yesterday, and one of these carts came in, and I thought, that's great. These carts are depicted on the uh, bas reliefs in the Bayonne and in many other places. And they're an exact replica of, uh, or these are an exact replica of the originals with 16 spokes and the same design, detail, um, and pulled by buffaloes or bu uh, bulls. Um, they used to be fairly common. I haven't seen them quite so often you know, nowadays. They've moved over to larger uh, smoke belching vehicles. Okay, next one. Now this again is a great bone of contention with me. When we were working, uh, there was a gang of uh, people who went around doing maintenance. And so they would come in and put a support in timber and more often than not, the amount of timber they used was totally unnecessary. But more importantly was that you could actually have done a proper repair job if, uh, for the amount of money that they spent on timber. Timber is very, very costly here, and uh, it seems so crazy to build this, something of this size uh, just to support something that you could have used a couple of, uh, of verticals. And I remember we had one place where it was a, quite a complicated roof structure. Two minutes? One minute. <laughs> I have ten minutes of, of questions. I you? gave you a lot of time. <laughs> okay. I'm joking. Um, where we, we looked at it, my engineer and I, and he said, oh, yes, you just need one bit of tree there. And we put it in. And now you go in and see something of this complexity and they still haven't repaired it. We could have done it for that amount of money. So this, you know, is partly 
I feel the, the responsibility of the guy who's in charge managing it, and it's something that I've trained all the guy, all the, all my workers to understand the philosophy of conservation, trying to achieve the best for the least. Okay, next. And this is another wonderful example on one of the bar reliefs showing a timber structure with a pitched roof and a lot of fun going on underneath bargaining, but you know. Okay, next. Just, just I thought it was important to show that uh, these are some of the, the uh, domestic structures. All domestic structures were built in timber. Okay, even the palace uh, was built in timber, stone, and was certainly reserved for the gods. Next. These are the modern versions of it. Now they use, uh, tend to use a, re a reinforced concrete uh, frame as opposed to timber there. Next. Images. These are much later, but um, in fact these are all, um, how these are very young. I mean they're, they're actually being made out of old pieces of timber, but they're very beautiful. Next. And here is interesting, is a combination of stone, and this hand actually is in timber, and you can see the, uh, the joint where the timber would have been, and this head. And then the whole thing was lacquered to hide it. Okay, next. Last but not least. <laughs> I showed this because these boats are fantastic. And I had the great uh, opportunity of actually being a paddler. And you go rushing down here, it's about five minutes run, uh, and no one wins, and then you have to take an hour and a half coming back up again to go on for the next race. So, um, boats are, you know, you could spend the whole afternoon talking about the manufacture of boats, but uh, they're made of wood, of course, and some of them are fantastic in detail. I'll tell you that story next time. So, thank you very much indeed.